All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, friends, colleagues, and uh, here in this room and online. Well, welcome to our teacher and welcome to this uh, session. And apologies for the technical problems. And you know what happens when technology fails? It fails completely. You know, <laughs> it's so hard to recover from that. And this particular session, uh, because it's the artwork of my dear friend, uh, Professor Jeffrey Quinn, we couldn't really kind of like go to another modality. We have to use this uh, set of slides. So, hence, we have to wait nearly half an hour. We are starting late, but um, nevertheless, uh, I'm sure it's going to be a fantastic uh, session. We are halfway through our uh, history. Uh, it's Wednesday, we started on Monday, and in this peace break, we have over 30 events, different types of events. In fact, we started this tradition in fall 2020. It's the sixth peace break we organized. We did it, uh, do this twice a year. And the purpose is really to bring our community together, our faculty, our students, our <laughs> um, wider community of friends and uh, our partners. And uh, because when it comes to the work of peace and conflict resolution, we really need to find different ways of reaching out to different audiences. And, and this session is particularly important for that because um, the role of the arts and the way it really allows us to see the world in a different way and question ourselves in a different way. And I think for peace and conflict resolution, it's so important. And as a Carter School, uh, we started working in this particular area uh, quite recently. And in fact, uh, here in this room, uh, I have my dear friend, Mel Hardy, uh, who will be leading another program on the arts and peace building. Uh, it's a non-credit program that started in the school. Uh, and that's really largely because who we are here at the party. Our scholarship, our teaching, obviously that matters to us. And I have a number of my students here for my class, and, uh, but also our relevance for conflict-affecting communities, whether they are here in Arlington or in Afghanistan. Really being able to show that the Carter School, that's something that really changed their lives, right? And to do that, I think the arts is a very kind of critical role to play. So Professor Shakti Fren is from the College of uh, Visual and Performing Arts here at the, um, at the George Mason University. And in fact, when we started the Peace Week, the very first one, it was a quite a domestic affair. <laughs> It was only our faculty as students presenting. But now, number six, we have so many events being held by our partners, both from George Mason University and beyond. It really shows the kind of like the way that we are uh, having a great impact. You know, it's, a, it's not necessarily a trickle effect. I'm really talking about um, uh, the kind of uh, increasing our impact peace and conflict resolution by doing this work in different ways. So without any further, we are here to listen to Shaggy and his wonderful work. And by the way, I had the opportunity of visiting his studio uh, a few weeks ago. Oh my God, it's simply breathtaking. Uh, Professor Friend is also from Lebanon and he brings so much from the uh, region of uh, the Middle East, from Lebanon, but also who he is as a human being. I mean, you will get to know him during, during his presentation. He is absolutely delightful as a person. And, and what he does, I mean, I think, you know, um, he really feels the matters of peace in his heart. So the work that you are gonna see in this presentation, it's not just, you know, it's work of art. It is really 
Passover to check your friend and the way he sees the world. So this is the opposite of what happened to uh, sponsor his event here as part of our group. And thanks very much for joining us in person and online. And all of you should be. Thank you. Thanks so much. Good afternoon. The first thing I want to say is thank you to Dean Art for sponsoring my presentation. I cannot thank you enough for accepting my proposal, for visiting my studio, and for the incredible work that you do here at the hand of the Carter School. I cannot thank you enough. Um, as he mentioned, I am a professor in the School of Art here at Dog Mason. And as he rightfully mentioned, I'm not lecturing in here. I'm not interested in lecturing. I do that enough in my classes. I'm here to share with you my life journey towards peace, personal and collective. Why am I here? I'm here because I genuinely feel the arts have a voice and a very long voice to play, to talk about peace, and to be present in its fullest might and its fullest universality, because art is a universal language. To really talk about issues that concern all of us, not just me, not just that, not, not just the Middle East, not just America. When I read about Peace Week, I immediately went to the Carter School because they said, if you want to participate, you need sponsors. So I went to your page and I'm reading the first, the second, I'm reading the little bios of all the faculty. I didn't know anybody. This is the first time ever. And what a great honor to take part of this. So I'm going down the list. I'm reading the bios and I get to a bio and you know he is the dean. I'm reading that he has written many, many books on Middle Eastern conflict and he has the word Lebanon in his bio. And the right word on He made that. that. And that's how I got to be connected with you, not because you are the dean. And what a great honor to know the dean himself is sponsoring my talk. So thank you. I want to say thank you to Mercedes and to Amber and to all the people who make this peace week amazing and wonderful and shareable with so many people in India and in Lebanon and in Turkey. I have many friends who are literally on a different time zone. So thank you. And I want to start by saying, please take a second to read this because I wanted to put it in writing. Can we take this off? I don't know how to do that. So why am I here with Peace Weeks? Because since I was a child, I was born in Lebanon. I left Lebanon at the age of 19. I grew up Catholic. I was Catholic to the bones. And I really wanted to be a priest when I was 13 years old. And I remember when I came at the age of 19, and I wanted to mention that because it relates very strongly to the work that I'm doing. I remember I was laying in bed. I'm on one bed and my mother on the other with three feet in between. And my mother is telling me, what do you want to do with your life? And I said, I want to be a painter. And my mom said, why can't you be an architect? You lose your art and you have a job, you make money. And, and we're going back and forth, back and forth. And I really remember so powerfully. At one point, I said to my mother, hey, I know what I want to be. And she said, what do you want to be? I said, I want to be a saint. And my mother started crying. And she said, please be enough. <laughs> and the reason why I thought of the story is because I genuinely believe being a saint is not to be canonized by Rome or by the Vatican. Being a saint is literally to treat others like you want to be treated. There is nothing complicated about that proposition. If I want to be treated a certain way, this is the way that I need to treat others. And the self-reflection began. So, so again, I want to take 30 seconds please to read this because I tried to put in words before my lecture why I think what I'm saying. 
and I want to talk about what gives fire to my art. When I teach, I often speak about the fire in the belly to my students. I talk about that things that cannot be taught, that cannot be given. I talk about the things that really burn inside of us, our passion, our obsession, what keeps us waking at night. And I can honestly tell you that what keeps me going with the intensity and with the love that I have is the desire that my work is meaningful beyond the boundaries of art. And when I have this opportunity, I jump on it because in my diving into the sources of why I do what I do, this is where I began. The only reason why I started with this is because, yes, I lived in the war for five years before coming to the United States. We were like 50 people in a little room. We didn't know if the light of the day is going to be shining on us. Bombs were around us, you could smell the bombs in the shelter. And when I was doing both my bachelor and my master, the war in Lebanon was still going on. So I remember many, many times as a teenager, as a young 20, 22 years old boy, it's like, why did I get a chance to leave Lebanon when there are thousands of other people who couldn't? And the feeling of emission through my art was more and more crystallized. The reason why I have that painting next to it is called uh, The Ultimate Solitude. And The Ultimate Solitude, this is not self-portrait, but it is in a way self-portrait. It's me meditating on the elements of life and death inside of me, because that little figure there is a symbol of an embryo of birth and a symbol of a Peruvian mummy, a symbol of death. And in my belief, life and death doesn't happen once in a lifetime, they happen daily. Some things give birth every day, friendship, thoughts, feelings, emotion, knowledge, and some other things die. And that is the interaction of life and death that I saw happening inside of me. I have to say that last night, I was up till two o'clock devising it, wanting to create the story to make as personal as I can make it, because I really feel I'm sharing my life story and my life's desire for peace. It started from a personal journey, like the Dean said. This is me when I had hair and mustache. I wasn't always like that. <laughs> and I want to tell you that in my personal life, coming from Lebanon and a set of, of values to America and to a completely sometimes different set of values and not just different, sometimes opposing each other. I really felt that fight inside of me. Do I believe what I have learned for 20 years in Lebanon as the values that I could live with? Or do I have to adopt some of the values here? And even in the process of adoption, I use the word saint and prostitute intentionally. Why? Because one of them is associated with everything moral and right and good, and the other one supposedly is associated with everything that is bad and rejected by society and frowned down upon. This one is called accept, reject. One is saying accept, one is saying reject. And you could see how the art has become a voice and inner search for that piece to really see the fighting elements inside of me and to see how one is associated with good, one is associated with bad, and they are clashing with each other. And you know what? That is an element that is trying to say, what is this division? What is this contradiction? What is this opposition? And then in a way, in my journey, these opposing elements have become complementary elements that really make the wheel of life turn. And I want to say that as a student, I started to learn about artists that I absolutely admired in a way that gave me the license to really talk about violence and war in my art. I, I was a, a little boy from Lebanon. What's wrong with you? You come to America to, to, to paint about, about death, to paint about war and violence. Why don't you do something that you can sell? I've been told that all my life. But I really believe that it takes a lifetime to do the work that you are doing. It is not an intellectual 
um, journey. It's not a uh, academic journey. It's a life that you really transfer, like the globe of a sand clock, where the elements of life, the mind, the heart, the tears, the prayer, the the, 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 the passion is transferred from the globe of life to the globe of art. When people ask me, what do you paint with? I don't tell them I paint with oils. I tell them I paint with my own heart and mind. You want to know me, look at my art. So these artists, everybody knows Guernica. It's a very iconic image. And it's very, very important painting that really speaks about the horror that we cause each other when we really are claiming that we are right and you are wrong, but unfortunately, people who have the power always have uh, the right to write the history according to their triumph. The only reason why I included this painting is because it really brings back the Catholic in me. I don't know what I am anymore, but I absolutely love about the crucifix and the dead soldier here who has the crown of thorns. And in my Catholic upbringing, somebody told me human suffering is divine suffering. Divine suffering is not Christ on the cross. Yeah. Our suffering is divine. And I absolutely love how another artist, Philip Evergood, made that connection between all the people who are rejected and uh, the divine suffering of Christ. When I was a graduate student in, uh, at Temple University. I went to the program in Rome for my second year. And in Rome, I have discovered this window. When I went to Rome, I did all my research to do landscape, archeology, span architecture, churches, everything that Rome is known for. And basically I studied all the French artists who wanted to see the Rome, and I looked at Corot and other artists and I said, yeah, that's what I want to do. And I started my year in Rome by taking my easel on the street and painting what I see. In one of my walks looking for architectural subject matter, I passed by this shop. This is me with hair and mustache. And in 1987-88, the war in Lebanon was still going on. Officially, the war ended in 1990. And the Syrian occupation lasted another 25 years or so, and actually is still going on now politically because they have their puppets in the Lebanese government. So when I saw this, I did not see dolls. I don't play with dolls. I saw a humanity that is tossed on top of each other, a humanity that is broken. The eyes are out. They are, they are heads with no bodies. And the man and his wife and his son are sitting every day fixing the doll. They are not dolls for sale. If you have a doll that your great grandmother gave your grandmother and your mother passed to you and you want to pass to your daughter, you bring it here and you would they would restore it to its original shape. Meaning if it is a German doll from the 18th century missing an eye, they will find an eye from a German 19th century doll and restore your doll. And I remember the powerful feeling is who will restore our humanity? And I started to paint dolls. And the dolls, I painted dolls for many, many years, and they have become symbol for a broken humanity. The title of this painting is Truth Slaughtered with Her Disposable People. Just think about that disposable people that are in every culture and in every uh, politician mind. Look at all the people that, okay, they are subhuman. We don't acknowledge their humanity. We don't acknowledge that we share something with them. And we really feel so self-righteous getting rid of them or blocking them or minimizing them. And by the way, I want to tell you that I am one of the of the disposable people here. To go back to the war in Lebanon, there is no going back. I started to see Lebanon everywhere. I started to feel conflict everywhere. I started to see the liberalization of the world everywhere, including here in America. The division, the hatred, the not being able to hear the other because we don't want to hear them. We just want to tell them what we believe. That is why 
the civil war with all the number of the people that became data and statistics. There is a self-ported here, one of the first that I did fully new self-ported to talk about the vulnerability and the importance of the individual. And when I did this painting, I called the, our, our human rights were not their national interest. Our human rights were not their national interest. And all of you, I think, are much more informed, much more than me, about how where there is national interest, we talk about human rights and we invade and we change the regime and we do coup and we do whatever we want because we are accountable to nobody. I'm sorry that this is on because you cannot see the title. This is called Your Silence I Suffer. And this is called Ton um, Silence Martel in French, Your Silence Calls Me. And the reason why I doubled the images because like when you go to a gallery and I'm not there, the images are having discussion with each other and hopefully they inform each other as they inform the viewer. That is why I have put many two in one slide. Both of these give you silence. When I say your silence, I suffer. Whose silence is your? Is it the silence of the broken people that is making that figure suffer? Is it the silence of that figure that is making them suffer? Or is it our silence that's making both of them suffer? I try, and I'm very conscious when people ask me, who is your audience? I don't know who is my audience. My audience is you. My audience is everybody who is confronting the figure, the painting. My audience is someone who is really taking the time to say, I'm going to allow the painting to bring out the emotions and the thoughts in me, as opposed to saying, what does the artist mean? Why did the artist uh, do that? It's not about the artist. And I am the artist, and I'm telling you, it is not about me. I promise you, I'm not saying that for the sake of today. I always say the art is about you. What does it say to you? What does it bring up emotions and thoughts and feelings in you? And that is what counts. And when you avoid that, you say, oh, what does the artist mean? This one is called Sick Transit Gloria Mundi. Thus ends the word glory. We fight each other. Look at where the time that you are in now. Everybody is racing for nuclear arm and more arm and no more budget. Where are we headed? This is how the word glory will end with complete destruction. Another very, very large painting. Before I came to George Mason, I've been at George Mason for 22 years. About 10 years earlier, I had an exhibit here in town, in a gallery. And it was the first time I go to the Holocaust Museum. And in that time, they had a show where they had literally huge posters, as big as this window, of statements by the masters of war, by the lords of the war. One of these statements said, who of us speaks today of the annihilation of the Armenians? I swear to you, if you don't know who said it, you would think this is one of the most compassionate and just statements. Why don't we talk about the annihilation of the Armenians? But when you know that Hitler is the one who said that, you can get into the evenness of the human mind. He said, okay, this happened 30 years earlier. No one's talking about it now. Let me do what I want to do in, in 30 years. No one will talk about it. What I wanted to say about this painting and about this painting, if you really look at the composition, it is a composition that goes endlessly in all four directions, which means it's a detail in a greater form. Okay? These are two paintings. Each one is four feet by eight feet. I did these two paintings during the first Iraq war. I titled this one, Are We Standing on What We Stood For? I titled this one, National Interest Versus the Human Rights. National Interest Versus the Human Rights. And I remember when I was teaching in Boston, I put these two slides and I asked my students, what do these slides tell you? And it's very interesting because so many people interpreted this Half of the class interpreted it as a true American painting, and half of them 
interpreted as against America painting. And both of them use the same symbol to say why they thought this way. As you can see, it's filled with skulls inside. Skulls are around it. Instead of the Torch of Liberty, there is the power of the army, which is a medieval armor. And from the constitution, you have a hand reaching out for help before it drowns. This was done more than 25 years ago, more than 30 years ago. And look at how George Washington is a steel man standing on the indigenous people. When I hear that in America, in the United States of America, we are banning books. When I hear in the United States of America, we're telling people what they can and what they cannot say. When we hear in the United States in America, even in the academia world where free thought and free debate and free discussion can take place, so many faculty are losing their job because they said the wrong thing. I ask the question, what kind of America we have become? Another large painting, we're talking about 100 inches by 80 inches. The title of the painting is, is Liberty Leading the People. And you see Liberty literally exiting the space. The people are destroyed. The people are symbolized by a woman holding her child, begging, begging military might to spare her son. And the specter of death with the clock time is really ticking as we go further and further toward the right of might instead of the might of rights. This one is called the Holocaust, and this one is called the Holy Cost. And of course, both of them are a play on the word Holocaust. So when I really think about what's happening to our world, why do we continue to learn nothing from our history? Why do we keep repeating the same self-justification and self-righteousness when we destroy the other? Why, when I look at someone else, I don't see their humanity. I see the label that I put on them. And in my label, I feel so self-righteous in manipulating everything I can in my power, the press, the police, the army, the politicians, the people, to let them know that we are on the right side and they are on the wrong side and we can really annihilate them. This one is called the War of Civilization. Obviously, we have the Washington Monument and this is one of the biggest uh, mosque in Morocco. And there was a period where the clash of civilization was in the news almost every day. I remember that period. And it's like us and them, and we cannot meet, we cannot see eye to eye, they have different value. We have... And if that fire really took place, this is not a person, this is humanity that is gonna be played in the middle. This is called Sacred and Profane Love. This painting was exhibited in a gallery in Bethesda, and we had a gallery talk, and the gallery director asked the people, which is the sacred and which is the, the profane? And again, there is a division where the people bring their own interpretation and their own vision of things. Some people say this is the sacred, because we had nothing to hide. And this is the profane, because we are hiding all the deception that we have done, create the war. And other people said, no, 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 this is the sacred one. That is why it's covered with the American flag. And look how profane that is. That is why it doesn't deserve even to be covered. And it is unbelievable how the same image is interacting and reacting with where we are in our journey toward peace. I put this slide yesterday. I want Dean Alp to know that I apologize because I added more than the 35 that I have 
strongest. <laughs> I wanted to create the narrative to make it more personal. I was so appalled that a director of a school in Florida lost her job because the teacher showed David to young children and she lost her job. And they called this pornography. Do you know that I did this painting more than 35 years ago? Do you know what the title of the painting? In Florida, they call David pornography. This is called pornography is in the eye of the beholder. Okay, you wanna see pornography? You can see Jesus on the cross and see pornography. Where are we headed? This is the question that I ask myself almost every day. Where is America going? And as you can see, when I talk about peace, you know, the, 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 the theme is peace at home and in the world. Why can I talk? How can I talk about peace in the world, about bringing peace to countries with conflict when my own home, I cannot have peace with the people that are around me. I cannot hear what the other is saying because I already made my mind that they are wrong and I am right. Did I ever, I've been in America for 42 years. Did I ever thought a day would come where David is called pornography and somebody loses his job because she showed the work to students? This is not the America that I came to four years ago. As you can see already, I have a lot of symbolism and a lot of metaphor that I use in my art. I have used uh, broken dolls, I have used the skulls, and I did a series that also lasted four years where I used the slaughtered animal. You guys here in America do not see the animal. You see them packaged in plastic, and beautiful presentation. In Lebanon, we see them. People don't know what this is. This is, this is a, 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 a sheep hanging by its hind leg. And that's interesting and the tummy are going out. And I want to tell you the titles because they relate to the three leg things that we create to help each other, but we use to really oppress each other. Here is called kosher or halal. So we fight in the name of religion. This is called before or after. And it also addresses the religious issues. This is Adam and Eve in the Sistine Chapel. And this is called that you may live. And you know what? Some politicians take it to the level where not only I can spot, spot an animal that I may live, I may have to take that country so my country can live. Is this the element of peace? So when we talk about peace, we say, under whose terms? Under the term of the people who are ruling and really are accountable to nobody. They are the one who are deciding what peace is. I don't see it from that perspective. I see it from the perspective who, who are being hurt and who are being oppressed by the name of peace and justice and human rights because we always use beautiful emblems to do our evil work. And I call it evil by its name. This one is called Global, global Economy, the Bull of Rights. You know, I'm playing with the Bill of Rights. And yeah, just really, I mean, how can you not see how in the name of economic prosperity, we are really destroying the environment destroying the sea, destroying the soil, destroying the air, destroying independent countries because we own the resources that they have in their country. We have passed legislation that gives somebody in Switzerland or somebody in France or somebody in America the right to exploit and kill the indigenous people in Central and South America and in Africa in, in every place where they are third world countries. Why should they own the resources? And we make deals with the leaders there, we bribe them, and we get rid of a government that doesn't want us what we want to do, and we put a government who is a puppet for us. This is what I have done. This one is called caution, religion, and this one is called, don't worry, they have called us terrorists. 
I promise you, just think about that. The minute you call somebody terrorist, you don't have any compassion that they are killed. And he called, you know, I remember during the Reagan area, um, which country? He, we, we spoke about terrorists and freedom fighters. And some people call the freedom fighter terrorists and some people call the terrorist freedom fighter. So that is what people do and they do it so well because they have mastered the art of deception. If I am in your house and destroying your house and you're trying to rebel against me, you become terrorists. Why? Because I'm the strong one. See it happening all over the earth. Now the fourth symbolism that I have used besides the dog head, the skull and the spotted animal are shoes. And what I want to tell you that my experience with the shoes, even though I had that painting of the skull from the Holocaust Museum, they did not start by a reference to the Holocaust Museum. Anybody who has visited the Holocaust Museum, and I've been to Auschwitz in the spring break between the two semesters, and I swear to you, I understood why I'm doing the work that I'm doing now. But what I want to tell you, this has started when I was in London. I was at the National Gallery. And this was my third visit to the National Gallery. I go in at 10 o'clock when they open. I leave at 5 o'clock when they close. OK? So I left at 5 o'clock, and I saw a mass of people in Trafalgar Square. And it's like I've never seen it like this before. What's going on? And I look before I descend from the balcony, and I see like 12 feet mound of shoes in the middle of Trafalgar Square. What's going on here? I go down, there are a lot of people with data in their hand, with things that they want to share with people. And it was a demonstration against landmines. And they were saying all the countries that want to make landmine illegal, they want to say, they, they tell you about the countries that don't want to make it illegal, like America and Israel are two of them. And they spoke about how many years after the war, children would be playing in the field and a mine explodes, thus they lose their teeth. If it doesn't kill them, thus the shoes. And while I was talking to her, a voice in my head said, can you see a painting there? Take pictures. And these were done from the pictures that I have taken. Golgotha, as you can see, it's a mount. For those of you who do not know, uh, Golgotha is the name where the crucifixion took place. And again, maybe it is a, a, a meditation that I truly believe human suffering is divine suffering. Otherwise, divine suffering is not and nothing. I don't even know, know what it means otherwise. And this is called Peccata Mundi. And I have played with this. This was there around the shoes, but it was mine international handicap and i want the mind to be not mine in reference to the mind field but mine the ownership that it is i who is causing the international handicap by not using the power that i have to stop certain genocide and to politicize every conflict that there is around and to really create the circumstances that we need for us to get there and to get the resources. So it is mine. That's ownership. This painting is four feet by eight feet. So literally, it will not stand here. And this one is only 30 inches. This one is called uh, The Wall is Won, but Peace is Not. And this one, you really see a child with the mass of genocide behind him. And the, que the, the question is, what is peace? He's looking at you as the viewer. He's looking with the innocent look of a child and asking us, what is peace? Is peace more, more armament? Is peace more killing? Is peace more us and them? Is peace more divide and conquer? What is peace? This is the only painting that you will see that is an altarpiece in the fullest sense of the word. It's eight feet by eight feet when it's open, 
and it is eight feet by four feet when it closed. And we're talking about the role of the art as a voice for peace. The painting is called Misa Propatrum, Mass for Peace. When it's closed, you see the arts. You see painting, you see music, you see theater, you see dance, and you see music here. All the arts are there when we close the ugliness of, of, of what we are doing to each other, we really can celebrate our creativity. We can celebrate what we have in common. We can celebrate acknowledging ourselves in the other. But unfortunately, when you open it, you see all the symbolism that I have used thus far. You see the dolls, you see the skulls, you see the shoes. And I was gonna start a series with the jugs you know, as a container, symbol of container. Am I containing poison? Am I containing wine? Am I containing water? And it really speaks to each one of us as a container to ask a question. What is my life about? What do I contain that I want to share with other people? It's very important to know that when I teach at George Mason, I talk about three things that have become a nucleus of my teaching. I talk about the fire in the belly. I talk about all the things that, that cannot be taught or given, which means what is important to you? The second thing which relates strongly to where is your art is your voice. If your art is your voice, what is it that you want to say? We don't talk to just say, oh, how's the weather today? The weather is good, fine, that's it. If your art is your voice, what do you want to say? What you want to say is the fire that gives life and energy and purpose and meaning to your art, to your voice, to your existence. And the third thing is, it takes a lifetime to do the art that you are doing. This doesn't come from intellectual, I want to say it's not intellectual masturbation. It's not like I know something that you don't know. It's not like I am here, listen to me, I have something to tell you. No, no. It really is about how are my words and my images are interacting with what you are saying and doing and living. Two artists that I absolutely love and I included them side by side, Katie Colwith and Echo of Esquim, one of the great muralists from Mexico. And both of them include children. When people tell me your work is very depressing, and I will tell you the same thing, I will give you $10 if you find one happy painting in the work of Katie Colwith. Katie Colwith is an artist who lived during World War II and World War II, and Siqueiros lived and created these paintings after the Mexican Revolution. It is unbelievable when I see artists using the gifts that you are given to make a difference, to speak about war. When we speak about war, we are shining a light. I'm not focusing on war. I'm focusing the light on things that people don't want to even think about. And I promise you, I've had many discussions when we talk about war and violence and this and that. They say, I don't spend time on it because there's nothing I can do about it. And do you know what I tell you? I can do something. I can paint it up. And you know what? I've never thought I would be talking about it after 22 years of George Mason in a school of peace. So with the children, the children come into my art. Unwarranted influence. You have military power in a completely different panel as if it has nothing to do with the war that it has caused and with the destruction that it is causing. They are, yes, classical metaphor. You know, the, the, the army with their might, with their marble presence. I call them the white gloves. Every power that creates conflict, war, violence, all kinds of political upheavals. I call them the white gloves. They sit in their invisible places and they create a mess in the world. 
and this one is called Invisible Children. And you also can see the shoes in the background. But for me, this is a symbol of hope, which is look, look into a new horizon and new possibilities for peace. This one also, the children, is called nothing is personal, it's just economic interest. I promise you, so many things have become just economic interest. It is not, you know, just the resources. It's like, you know, we, if we get this country out of the way, we'll have better. Look how many people have, how, many, how, 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 look at the rights of the indigenous people in this country. Look at the rights of indigenous people anywhere in the world. We're having people who are changing in front of our eyes, democracies into autocracies. It's happening all over the world. And why are we going in that direction? Power and greed, not acknowledging the humanity of the other. And now, Citizens United. A child again looking at the seat of power. What I want to tell you before I start my second, my, I want to tell you something about something that I will show you with much less talk about my relationship to citizens United. I'm a little bit crazy, yeah, I know. A friend of mine who is in policy making and law, and she knows much, much more about things that I don't know about, explained to me that Citizens United is a Supreme Court decision that said money is free speech and corporations are free speech. I swear to you, you can see I'm crazy. I was cussing in my studio. I was swaying in my studio. I was angry in my studio. And I said to myself, who can hear me? Who, 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 whom are you talking to? What are your gifts telling you? Your gift is your art. Use your art to say something. And I was inspired, I have to say, in retrospect, by three amazing artists who did a series on the violence that is begotten from war. One of these artists is Goya. He did the disaster of war in response to the war between Spain and France. One of them is Otto Dix, who was in the trenches in World War I. He smelled the decaying flesh of his comrade. And I promise you, when I look at his work, I can smell the decaying flesh of the people. And the other more, one is Moore. He is a sculptor, John Moore. He is a sculptor. He did a series that he called War in response to the bombing of London by the Germans. He is known as a sculptor. I did not know that he did this series. And the fact that they are series really inspired my, my work. After I started, I, I, I need somebody to sustain. I would like you to take a second to read this. And the reason why I'm putting that, not because I'm, I'm, I'm Catholic, not because I'm expecting you to know these parables from Christ, from the Bible, but I intentionally included them in my book, which I hope to have the money and the publisher to do which is 107 paintings on the Constitution of the United States. When I said to myself, nobody can hear you, use your art to say what you want to say. I was at the National Archives. I went to the cathedral-like um, dome, and I looked at our uh, pa patriotic documents, and I went down to the bookstore before I leave, and I see that they have rows of the key documents that you can buy. A voice in my head said, buy one and start painting. I said, I don't work on paper. I work with oil. I don't work on paper. And the voice was so persistent. And I bought seven of them. I put them in the corner of my studio for almost three months. One day the voice said, do what you tell your students to do. 
put the first mark and follow it. And you know what happened? I followed it for 10 years, an entire decade. What started as my anger at Citizens United has morphed into what you're gonna see. And the reason why these are there because these are intentionally against all the militant Christians in this country who shake heaven and earth to talk about gay rights and gay marriage and family marriage, when many of them are married like five times, when many of them are married to women the age of their daughter, and they don't utter a single word about racial injustice or economic injustice or environmental injustice. Shame on them. You know, that is a quote from Jimmy Carter that I absolutely love. And that was there before I knew I was going to lecture here. America did not invent human rights. In a very real sense, it is the other way around. Human rights invented America. I love that quote. I love the gravitas of that quote. And the other one that I will read is this. I love America more than any other country in the world. And exactly for this reason, I insist on the right to criticize her perpetually. Wonderful, wonderful. And now I'm gonna talk much less and I will invite you to look more. Unfortunately, this is there because I have written something underneath each one of them. I don't recall it, you know. <laughs> but these are about the dark money. These are about the floodgates that says money is free speech and corporations are people. What you cannot read from over there, we the people are like insects and flies around the capital. And the capital is jammed with we, the corporation, repeated a million times. So all this here, which you cannot read, is we, the corporation, and all these flies around is we, the people. That is why the title of my talk today, we, the people, for so or for sure. When you are looking at all the policies, I know you know that more than me. They are bought by lobbyists and corporations who tell the people in charge what they should say and how they should say it. And I promise you, after living here in, in America for 42 years, I know for a fact that one of the most abused and misused uh, words in the American politics is the American people want this. The American people want that. The American people is. And they don't say it's the corporation that wants that. These are about, again, I do apologize for that. I don't know why it's there, but it is about how everything is politicized, whether it's the Supreme Court, whether it is the, the, uh, the Senate and the House, everybody is in the pocket of lobbyists and corporations because they would not have their positions if they didn't have, if they didn't bend backward to them and to their interests. And this is about what I said, instead of saying the American people, they say, oh, the American people want this and that, but they don't say we the corporations are saying that. And this is basically the same theme. The first half of my 107 paintings deal specifically with Citizens United and the influence of money on politics and policy. The second half, as you will see, deals with the human rights. This is a symbol of liberty as it falls from the dome and the lobbyists and the corporation are stealing our democracy. The White House, you know, that famous line, oh, they hate us because of our lifestyle. They hate us because of our human rights. They hate us because of our democracy, your watch. No, they don't hate me. I come from the Middle East. The Dean comes from the Middle East. Many people here come from the Middle East. We don't hate America because of democracy. We don't hate America because of human rights or their lifestyle or their freedom. We hate them because of what they're doing to the rest of the world. Because they're not treating the other as they treat themselves. You know what? 
this whole game is becoming more and more clear. Oh, you're Democrat, you're Republican, you're this, you're that. Everybody, you know, the see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. I know that you are getting paid by lobbyists and I know how much you're getting paid. So shut up, don't say anything about me and I will not say anything about you. It's as simple as that. And everybody is holier than thou. That is why they have the halos around them. Everybody is so sanctimonious in talking and lecturing and telling us what human rights are. When they pass laws that suppress us and allow themselves to do things that if we did it, we would be breaking the law. This is not right. Big Pharma, oh, I hate Big Pharma. <laughs> I, have, I hate Big Pharma. I really cannot believe the incredible greed, the unregulated greed that, how much is enough? You're destroying the world, you're destroying the health uh, services, you're destroying the hospital and pharma. Why? Why are you doing this? Money, that is the greatest enemy for peace. Greed. Unregulated capitalism, where look at what's happening. The, the best is yet to come. That's how it feels. And that is where I start switching from um, Citizens United to Human Rights. These two paintings are about the Native Americans, and you really can see how we whitewash what we did to the Native American and how we glorify Columbus and the people who invaded and really discovered America. And look what we did to, to them. This is about African-American rights. This is about women's rights. This is about, um, what do you call them? The people who come back from the war. <laughs> I'm sorry? Well, veterans. veterans rights, thank you. And I want to say, initially in my first um, PowerPoint, I had the image and I had a quote from one of the people from them in the capital for saying the damage that you are doing to the veterans, thank you. This is about LGBTQ rights and all of them, I don't know if you can see all of them, are painted on the Constitution of the United States. This is about prisoners' rights. This is about immigrants' rights. And what, what I wrote underneath this, your bomb made us immigrants. This, this is about um, and this is about homeless people rights. And this is about environmental rights. And one of the things that I did in many of them, I always, no matter how layered it is, I don't care if you cannot read the text here. I always wanted to see we the people visible. And I also in many of them highlighted the word done, which is in the document. But okay. We invaded your rights, done. We screwed media, done. We are creating trouble and chaos so we can control the situation, done. We really are responsible a lot to the ills that are happening around us because we are accountable to nobody. Justified war, you see just war, but it's justified. And this is about war as a racket. This is about war as money making for the few, even though the many are destroyed. And the question that I put under this one is where are we going? We are becoming a surveillance state. We can put something in Nevada and destroy someone in Afghanistan. We think we are playing, you know, a game like my nephew plays a game with someone who is in a completely different series. We are losing our humanity. I'm not afraid that, 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 that we have robots who are becoming more and more human. I'm afraid that humans are becoming more and more robotics. This is the painting that I did after 10 years of painting uh, on the Constitution of the United States. And 
the title of this poem is an homage to Desmond Tutu. The title of the painting is We Have Learned Nothing. And Desmond Tutu said, and he said, quote, the only lesson we learn from history is that we don't learn from history. And this is how I'm paying on it today. Shao E was Catholic, was Catholic, is I don't know what I learned, but I cannot tell you enough how the stigmata is a reference that again and again, when you think of the divine in the other, the divine is not out there. It's not after we die. The divine is here and now. When you recognize your brother as you, not as a black man, not as a woman, not as a gay, not as a lesbian. When you see the person and not the label, that is the divine. But we don't see them like that because they are disposable people. And even though he is in a sea of shoes that end in all four directions, he is without shoes. I'm finishing with this. I have two more slides. I'm almost done. I'm finishing with this as in terms of painting because people tell me, oh, you're too depressed. What is the hope in your art? And this is called the triumph of life. And you really can see all the war and all the violence and all the hatred becoming literally the soil out of which a new life begins. I truly believe that. I truly believe no matter how it takes, whether in our lifetime or in the ultimate world, I think good will triumph over evil. I do believe that love will triumph, will triumph over hatred. I do believe that in more, all my heart, otherwise I think I would have jumped at this window, but this is not how it is. <laughs> and this keeps me a little bit sane. Please read that this is a picture of neurons in the brain two millimeter across. And this is a picture of the universe one billion light years across. And you know what? Look how, forgive me with all due respect and love to you, look how stupid human beings are. We think we are the master of the universe. And we are lost between two infinities. Who are we? What are we creating? And please take a second to read that. Underneath this, it says, dare to be a bridge and not a wall. And this is my last slide. In conclusion, from all my heart, I hope I have said something that resonates with something that is already inside of me. I hope I touch something that is the core of what we all say. I don't know any of us, a couple of people ask me. I genuinely believe I, I, I was a Fulbright scholar in India. I lived there for six months. I traveled to Europe more than 50 times. I traveled to Mexico. I traveled to Argentina. I, I swear to you, I'm not saying it because of the lecture. Everywhere I go, I recognize myself in God. I recognize myself. In, 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 in the people who, who you call the untouchables. In, in. How do I do that? And this is my last line. I live in Arlington, not far from Cambridge. I would be in my car and I see a young, handsome, healthy black guy standing with a sign, help me. I'm in my car, I cannot stop. One day I was on my bicycle. I saw him standing there with his son. I stopped. Yes, I gave him a dollar. And I asked him, you're young, you're handsome, you're healthy. Why are you doing this? And he said, I am from Texas. I came here for jobs. I was working in a restaurant as a dishwasher. And I got sick. I lost my job. When I lost my job, I lost my house. 
I couldn't pay my rent. I'm applying for job, but I don't have a place where I can tell them to contact me. So I'm living under the bridge. I just want to raise enough money to go back to that. And I looked at him straight in the eye and I said, Do people start to talk to you? And he said, Yes, people give me a dollar. And I read in their eyes, Thank God I'm not turn. And I told him, Do you know why I stopped? I stopped because you are me, perfectly in those conditions. If life had me born in Texas to black, impoverished family where I have received prosecution for generations and I didn't have education and I didn't have a chance to do anything with my life because opportunities were taken away from me. I told him I would be perfect for you. On the other hand, if you were Lebanese, born to my family, you had a chance, your aunt did your paper to come to America, you had a chance to work as a busboy and as a waiter to really go through your education, you would be perfect for me. And I lived all my life like that. I lived all my life looking at the other and saying, you know what? If you believe in God, I don't know what God, or if you believe in God, I think God is that incredible oneness that is manifesting itself in and the flesh. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me give you a hug. I, mean, I think it's uh, such a powerful, such an insightful, and such an inspirational thought. Right? Unfortunately, we are running out of time, but as Chef says, this painting, this work is about you. So I don't want to let you go. You know, you've had the opportunity of you reflecting on this world. Not necessarily questions. I will only have the last 15 minutes because we have another event starting to be a story about that. Do you have any good idea to hear from some of you about what you just heard, what you just seen? Some reflection. A moment of reflection, not necessarily question. And that's not about the three people who work, but reflection on humanity, reflection on peace, reflection on life, the reflection that what we created for ourselves, right? And your juxtaposition of all the really powerful themes and issues you brought up. I mean, I think you could spend any three days to unpack them, but some really great. We just hear from you what shaped this world meant to you for your community. Yes, Rubia. And by the way, I had a number of my students in the classroom here, and they are just so wonderful. And uh, so we've been kind of spending lots of time on issues like this. So we're going to get some really interesting perspective. Uh, I'm not I'm a student at George Mason studying government and international politics and taking Professor Ozizan's um, class, conflict between the divided society and the peaceful. I cannot say enough. I'm lost for words right now, but I thank you so much for being here and sharing your stories and sharing your art. When you shared your artwork, I saw a reflection of you and your art. And I like that you used your passion, your fuel for fire to create something beautiful and to bring people together as we all here to see your art. When we try to find the answers within our politics or policy workers, when that has failed us, we use an outlet of um, art, film, writing, to express the feeling mm. when which we are so oppressed of, and that is an outlet mm. of everything. Mm. And I, I, I am. It's just amazing the work that you're doing. You're inspiring a group, large group of people, who are thinking all the same things but don't know where to go. Mm. So thank you, thank you so very much. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> we talked to that.
the last slide I put it last night because I really would like to continue this conversation. So please feel free to remain a key fan of the NU Nazi Museum. I would be honored to invite you for coffee, to invite you for wine, and meet with you one on one or with a group and continue this discussion. Anybody else? Yes. I'm gonna be the kind of like to be hired my students. <laughs> my name is Karela. First of all, thank you so much. It was amazing. And, and I've never seen your art before, but I feel like you said I see myself as you. Because I was not born or raised here, but um, I feel like that is a good way of coping, like with the reality that you have seen. And for many people that have been through that, mm. it's easy to turn a blind eye, mm. you know? And like the way that you were talking with Billy is something that I relate to mm. because sometimes it's hard not to get over kind of like that anger and mixed feeling of seeing how some people just. Or things, yeah, like not seeing that reality. It's easy just to like somebody to back it up and don't care about it, especially if it's privileged. And yeah, like that art expresses that. And I feel like that's an amazing coping mechanism because, yeah, many people don't get to like express that in a way because, yeah, especially being in, the, in one of the art countries that relate to all of that corporation and all of that business that is war. And yeah, like diving into that, I think it's very hard. Like it's something that I'm trying to work on too. So yeah, I, I, that is part of it. Thank you. Thank you, Sagara. Now we can take a few more, but by the way, I don't forget you, those friends online, that if you have any reflections to share, please raise your hand with, uh, you know, like, so I can see whether you have any reflections. While you are doing that. Can they hear me? Yes, of course. I want to tell you, Diana Yakar and her son are from Turkey. Zadin is from Turkey. So. <laughs> Everyone you said the work is very inspired, inspiring. And the most inspiring thing is the connectivity, the element of um, interconnectedness. I, my own personal God, I like to call keywords, which is it's defined as the end to which all things will be. So um, with the themes of globalization and us all coming together, it, I find it so interesting how like you're discovering the paradox like we're more isolated despite being more together and the word brings up a lot of paradoxes that are very complex and don't have answers but can only be discovered through art so i'm very thank you thanks Jenny. Hannah. hi um for one thing brilliant oh, thank you thank you thank you yeah like it, it was just deeply inspiring to me and it really illuminated to me as well that with art because it's so personal we put so much of ourselves into it there's no real barrier of entry all of us these feelings like you said you are me and i am you these feelings are innate to us these observations are innate to us and art is innate to us any one of us could do something and that's just inspiring I'm Anna. No. I, I am you. <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> um, I'm rarely at a loss for words. I'm very talkative. <laughs> and yes, she is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I often think about what type of impact I can even make as an individual. Um, considering that the systems are in place for a reason, right? Like, or there are everything that's happening has someone heavily benefiting, and there the, the way that these systems are like built to exploit, like, are on purpose, right? Like, 
it was not. If it were one person could get could have gotten rid of it, that would have already happened. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. it's not. I'm not the friend. Well, all of all of us like are here to kind of like address that. But um, I just your work and like your life is just an amazing example of power of like telling the story mm-hmm. that's been standing right in front of us mm-hmm. in order to show to one another like this humanity in, in all of us. Mm-hmm. And I am like, just, I'm really grateful that you were willing, like, or that you shared that, which, like, I am actually like, very grateful. So thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I want to, I want to expose one thing very, very quickly that you say you don't know how you tell you what you need to do. I have no clue. I swear to you, as a student at Mass College of Art in Boston, even as a student at Temple University for my master's, Life reveals itself to you when it needs to. You have to be patient and you have to trust the fire in your bed. And I really hope everybody in this room now is feeling the, 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 the dizzying effect of that light because sometimes that's what I wish I did to my students. Just by, not by what I say. People tell me you're very intelligent. Thank God I need them. And you know, she spoke about anger. I talked about that about one o'clock last night. Anger is a healthy emotion. Indifference is not a healthy emotion. Anger is not a destructive emotion. Indifference is a destructive emotion. So I wanted to address these two points. Thank you. Thank you. Um, last two, <laughs> Hannah. Um, thank you. Oh, my name is Hannah. I'm also one of the dean's students. Thank you for sharing. And thank you for like giving us this experience and opportunity. I just kind of wanted to speak to like the dichotomy that you were able to capture in your paintings, yet like the encompassing narratives that come with it, especially when you were saying like, is this like, is this the same uh, same to be one or is this one like the pure one? And like, I saw both. And I think that is just like, speaks to like the togetherness or singularity that we have because um, like amongst the different narratives and opinions and backgrounds and biases that we all have, like we can like as a humanity in a way like, be bridged through mm-hmm. arts and I think like I'm really interested in art as a cultural expression and like using art as a tool to mm-hmm. come together and I just think especially the dichotomy but encompassing narratives was like very motivational and inspirational so yeah thank you so maybe if I ask the dean if I can give a workshop or a class where we can use art <laughs> Gotcha. Well, we can use art for the students. You don't have to pay me, okay? <laughs> I never intend to. <laughs> Hello, my name is Dario and Steve. I'm also a student. But something that I really, really wanted to say is that your ability to capture such symbolism within your art truly speaks to your ability as a And as someone who has recently, I've been doing so much research into, say, you have famous people here in America, such as like Beyonce, who are revered for their artistic expression and ability to conduct and command a room in a very particular way. And you look at independent artists from such as people like Shakira, who is able to show passion and love and hurt through their work. And I think it's truly a testament to your ability to really command this space and be able to deliver such powerful messages through the work you are doing and have done. And I think that your work speaks for itself so beautifully. And it's so inspiring because as someone who finding Coming in, I had a class with Howard Ross the past week, and we were speaking to perspective bias and the abilities to be able to be in a space and observe multiple different, uh, if you will, emotions of people within that space, right? And as you were just saying, how anger and passion are really kind of rolled up into very particular perspectives when it comes to bias and how people interpret those things. But I think at its core, if you weren't to have that anger, if you weren't to have that passion, if you weren't able to have those outlets, 
how would you make the changes and impact that you have on people here? Because I certainly could say, and I think I could speak for everyone when I'm saying this presentation is certainly impactful. And the work that you're doing is going to impact, if not have already impacted, many, many more people into that space. So I just want to take some questions. Thank you. I actually done it. We can put that. Uh, I'm going to be fair. I think there is somebody online who would like to reflect too. And I'm going to make that really final one. <laughs> yeah, well, I have a friend in Holland. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to be long. I just want to say um, to Shawi, hello from Holland here. Hello. Okay. <laughs> Um, I hope you're seeing me. Yeah. Um, Shelby has been a really a long uh, time friend of mine. And for all the young artists, aspiring artists, I would really say it, with him, you can see the fruit of persevering through the really rough times, because I can tell you he has time. He's, he has really despaired and he didn't know when he was like in the United States at the beginning and he was catering to make his living uh, to keep going. And it was a really rough time. And I'm, I feel really privileged. I've seen him grow and innovate over those 40 years. I mean, is it 40 now? No, it's like 35 or something, That uh, 88. That's when we met. And um, I'm very grateful that I could participate here from uh, the Netherlands uh, <laughs> this Thank evening. You, yeah. An, another you. participant from Boston. Can I? Hello, somebody's from Boston. Yes. Could okay. I add a couple of things? Sure. Okay. My name is Charles Sackle from Boston. I am a, an engineer by profession and show is a very good friend for, I don't know, 25, 30, 35 years, God knows. <laughs> the, when I saw this great artist painting these touching images and paintings, it touches me, but I couldn't understand the depth of the sorrow. I understand the, the vulgarity of the crimes that were done in humanity. I think hearing him now express it, I understood his much deeper emotions about it and how he lived it. It's brilliant, shall we, like one of the attendees said, I applaud you to that. And I wish one good things also, in addition to what you did, and I pray for it, that one day you can also admire the kindness of you, a human being to do good and to work around it with the flowers and the trees, because the colors that you have in your pair things are incredibly beautiful. God bless you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Charles. Thank you, Charles. Uh, well, Pastor Chef, if you want to pass, and we love to meet you. Um, thank you so much. It was like really fantastic. And thank you so much for everybody. I don't want to have the last word. I don't have <laughs> and I had the honor of spending like two hours with this gentleman in my house and in my studio. I swear to you, it takes me time to open my heart and it is to somebody who didn't ask for permission. He just flooded me. <laughs> he just flooded me with his presence, with his art energy. I spoke about very, very personal things that I that when I thought back, it's like I hope he doesn't cancel my <laughs> <laughs> so not thank you enough for giving me this opportunity. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here, guys. Thank you for being here, guys. Thank you.